In the early hours of Thursday, on February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed his nation, announcing a special military operation against Ukraine. As we cross 600 days into the war, it is a crucial to examine the root cause of the conflict and deliberate on the roadmap towards peace. Hello everyone, I am Neelima, Associate Research, Center for Public Policy Research, and welcome to the talk on a contemporary view on the war in Ukraine by Dr. Samir Puri, organized by the Center for Public Policy Research in collaboration with Research Center for Contemporary Challenges at the University of Pest, Hungary. The Center for Public Policy Research is an independent public policy think tank based in Kochi. Our engagement in public policy that began in 2004 has initiated open dialogue, policy changes, institutional transformation in the areas of international relations and security, livelihood, education, urban reform, health, governance, law and related subjects. To know more about what we do, please do visit our website www.cppr.in. Talking about the Research Center for Contemporary Challenges at the University of Pex, Hungary, they aim to study the contemporary challenges, approaching them from a multidisciplinary perspective, including several fields of the humanities and the social sciences. Research in RCCC focuses on contemporary phenomena that present serious challenges to the modern society, so that a study thereof and the elaboration of appropriate response strategies would import social benefit. Today, we are privileged to be joined by Dr. Samir Puri, visiting lecturer, King's College London, and senior fellow, Urban Security and Hybrid Warfare, International Institute for Strategic Studies, Singapore. I extend my warm welcome to you, Dr. Puri. Before we proceed with I today's want to talk, say, uh, I a big thing. Oh, sorry. So I was just going to say thank you yeah, very you much. Sure. Before we proceed with today's talk, I would like to specially thank uh, Professor Istvan Persil, who is a professor in the Department of Medieval Studies and Director of the Center for Religious Studies at Central European University, Vienna, for making this event happen. He has a great connection with Kerala as well. He has worked on the Syriac Christianity, including the Syriac Christians of India. In the year 2000, he initiated the digitization and cataloging of the manuscript collections of the St. Thomas Christians of Kerala. And I extend my welcome to Professor Iswan as well. So coming to today's talk uh, on the contemporary view on the war in Ukraine by Dr. Samir Puri. Tracing the relationship between two countries from the breakup of Soviet Union in 1991 to Putin's invasion in 2022, what emerges from Dr. Puri's uh, book, Russia's Road to War with Ukraine, Invasion Amidst the Ashes of Empire, published in the year 2022, is a portrait of a nation caught in a geopolitical tug of war between Russia and the West. While Russia is identified as the sole aggressor, he sees how Western bodies such as EU and NATO unrealistically raised Ukraine's expectations of membership before dashing them, leaving Ukraine without former allies and fatally exposed to Russian aggression. Dr. Puri has had a ringside seat to several major events covered in his book. He served as an international observer at uh, five Ukrainian elections, including the Orange Revolution in 2004. Uh, after the first Donbass war, which began in 2014, he also spent a year in East Ukraine, working along both sides of the front line as part of an international ceasefire monitoring mission. He used this experience to ask honestly, how did we get here? Why does Vladimir Putin view Ukraine as a natural pro property of Russia? Did the West handle its dealing with these countries prudently? Or did it flame the tensions left amidst the ruins of the Soviet Union? Was there any missed opportunities to avert the war? And how might this conflict end? At the end of the talk, we'll be having a Q&A session. I encourage all the online participants to drop in their questions in the chat box. Now I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Puri. Uh, you may take over from here. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Uh, clearly, this is an event that everyone is following. So exactly as we've discussed in the introduction, what I want to talk about is the background and some insights into the future. Uh, I don't want to, of course, repeat what you already read about on the news every day. So clearly, uh, you can tell from my accent, I'm from the UK. 
you can tell I'm sure that my heritage is Indian from Punjab. So I have no connection to Ukraine at all. So the first question, of course, is how I came to have any kind of involvement uh, in Ukraine. And the answer is by pure coincidence. In 2004, in the UK, I had just finished my university studies and I was looking for international experience. And there was a job I'd never heard of called international election observation, uh, which means you go with either the UN or European Union or these sort of bodies. You go to another country where democracy maybe is quite a new thing, and you are part of a team that judges whether democracy is being practiced fairly. Very simply, that means teams of these observers go to polling stations, they see if there's any cheating going on, they see whether the process is fair. Anyhow, I was in my early 20s and I applied and was accepted to go to Ukraine in 2004. Now, little did I know, because I had no knowledge about Ukraine previously, that this turned into Ukraine's most important event since its independence from the USSR in December 1991. In 2004, something happened called the Orange Revolution. You may be familiar with it, but if you're not, very simply, there are two men called Viktor, Yushchenko and Yanukovych, respectively running to become Ukraine's next leader, next president. Uh, one of them, Yushchenko, uh, was more modern in his mindset and a bit more favoring of the West. And the other one, Yanukovych, was much more uh, favoring of Russia. That doesn't mean to say he wanted Ukraine to join Russia, but it meant that he personally was from the east of Ukraine, the Donbass region, now very famous because of the conflict, which is more, more prevalent with Russian speakers and has a strong heritage because it's so close to Russia of, I think, a lot of close integration with Russia. It turned out, and my own experience of this was, I, I went to three different places in Ukraine. I went to Lviv, which is in the west, it's next to Poland, where as an international election observer, I and my Hungarian colleague, actually, uh, I'll never forget, I had a Hungarian colleague called Attila. Attila the Hungarian and I were monitoring the election, and we were in pairs with a local interpreter. In Lviv, it was really uh, very next, close to Poland, very nice for them to receive international observers from other parts of the European Union. Uh, then I was in a place called Kalmanitsky, which is uh, closer to Kiev, but quite rural. And then for the third round of this election, I was in Nikopetrovsk, which is closer to the Donbass, not inside the Donbass, where in 2004, as a foreign election observer, I was given a less warm welcome. And specifically what we found in the more eastern part when we were uh, performing our duties there was there was cheating. And the thing that we noticed was there were voters lists of dead people from a particular village or city. And those dead people had someone else taking a ballot paper on their name and putting it in there. So o OAPs, older people, so people would vote multiple times. And these were the supporters of the Russian face facing candidate Yanukovych. To put that into a nutshell, the Russian favoring candidate cheated in order to win uh, the election. Now, on the other hand, and I'm trying to give this talk without passing any kind of judgment, uh, the Western facing candidate had been receiving for several years a lot of training in how to contest an election campaign from American organizations uh, which are tied to the US government. Uh, all sorts of these organizations training young people around how to campaign more effectively, how to deliver their message more effectively. This isn't cheating, but you can see how people on one side of Ukraine thought, well, you Americans and the, and the Europeans want that guy to win. Vladimir Putin wants the other guy to win. It's just that Putin and the Russians cheated very, very directly with these sorts of techniques I'm describing. And of course, the most famous episode from here was the fact that the pro-Western candidate was poisoned. You may remember the, the footage of his face becoming completely disfigured uh, because someone poisoned him after he went for a private dinner with, I think, the deputy head of Ukraine's security services. The outcome was that the pro-Russian candidate won the second round, the runoff, 
And there were huge street protests that didn't disperse until, uh, with the evidence from the election observers, a rerun was forced. But to bring all that into significance, what I think we have is that the pro-Western candidate won the election finally, and Vladimir Putin, at that point, only three or four years into his time as president of Russia, said that the West will only accept an election result if their favoured candidate wins the election. My favoured candidate won the runoff in uh, October, but you forced them to rerun the election because my favoured candidate won. Therefore, the West, you stole the election. I'm not saying that that's my view, but I am conveying to you that that is how Putin and the elites of the Russia's foreign policy drew a conclusion from 2004, which is that the West was trying to take Ukraine into its orbit. So this brings me to the next point, which is the journey from 2004 to 2014, which is my next bookmark in giving you a chronology around what happened. Uh, what happened is that certainly, and this is something I think people have only come to realize subsequently, everyone remembers the presidency in America of George W. Bush. Everyone remembers it for the war in Iraq and the response after 9-11 and the occupation of Afghanistan, which began under George W. Bush. Everyone remembers uh, Bush Jr. for being very ideological, thinking that military force could be used to bring democracy. Everyone knows this. But because of Iraq, I think what people didn't pay as much attention to was what the Bush administration was trying to achieve in Eastern Europe. Remember that Bush Jr.'s father was the president when the Berlin Wall fell and democracy was spread to countries like Hungary, countries like Poland in the years afterwards. And it seems to be the case that Bush Jr. fairly easily accepted the idea that he was carrying on his father's work by bringing further westernization and democracy further into Eastern Europe. And once again, I'm not passing a moral judgment on this, but it certainly appears to be the case that the US and the European Union had discussions and thought about how to bring Ukraine more closely into the West. And a very active discussion around that time was around uh, Ukraine joining the European Union. It was still considered to be too controversial for Ukraine to join NATO. And we know, of course, the European Union is an economic club, doesn't include America. NATO is a military alliance, it's headed by America. Uh, there was one very famous incident, which I go back over in my book, in the 2008 uh, Bucharest NATO summit. NATO has these summits on a regular basis in a different European, uh, well, not European, different NATO member state every time. In 2008, George W. Bush's administration strongly backed Ukraine's uh, membership action plan to join NATO. And at the time, uh, Angela Merkel of Germany, and uh, I think it was Sarkozy of France, both opposed the American idea of bringing Ukraine into NATO. And very famously, that 2008 NATO summit ended with a very odd promise which its final communique, as you know, these diplomatic summits have a communique, it said that Ukraine and Georgia will one day join NATO. It promised no time scale, but it made the open promise. It's the NATO open door. This infuriated uh, Putin and the Russians who considered it not a good thing that Ukraine had not been admitted to NATO. They considered it a disaster that NATO was considering it inevitable that Ukraine would one day in the future join uh, NATO, which is the, the disaster, I think, in Putin's mind is obviously if Ukraine was in NATO, then the Ukrainian armed forces would be NATO armed forces. And theoretically, uh, NATO militaries from the UK, USA, France, wherever, could presumably travel anywhere within uh, Ukraine. That's, again, the Russian uh, perspective there. Uh, the EU membership bid for uh, Ukraine ended up being a, uh, an accidental disaster because in 2013 there was uh, a technical agreement that the EU presented to Ukraine which would have allowed a, a, pr a prior step to joining the European Union. Uh, Russia offered its own counter proposal and this tug of war is what led to the Maidan protests in 2013, in late 2013, because in the end Viktor Yanukovych, 
the pro-Russian candidate I mentioned from 2004 was actually back in charge in, in Ukraine. He had actually become president in 2010. He, being a bit more Russian leaning, refused to sign this EU accession agreement. Uh, it's a very technical agreement, as I say, which would have been a precursor step to Ukraine's economic uh, integration with the European bloc, which is understandably uh, Yanukovych as the Ukrainian president was trying to play both sides. He was courting the Europeans and courting the Russians, thinking he was being very clever about this. In the end, the whole thing fell on, in on top of his head because in Kiev in particular, there were very bitter street protests that became very violent by pro-Western Ukrainians who were absolutely distraught, very upset that this EU accession agreement wasn't going to go ahead. So taking stock of all of that, because I don't want to talk for, for too long myself before we have a bit more of a discussion, uh, that's when I went to Ukraine for, for the next period of work that I did, which was um, that protest in Kiev ended up de deposing Viktor uh, Yanukovych uh, because he was his rule became untenable. When his rule became untenable, he fled to Russia, which was clearly an indication of where his support was uh, where his natural uh, sense of protection would have been. Uh, but Ukraine itself then experienced something it had never experienced since independence in 1991, which was war. I want to pause for one moment and just give a, a slightly global perspective on this. Uh, we all know what the end of empire means for different countries around the world. All empires are different, but it is quite common that when an empire ends, especially when an empire ends very suddenly, that there can be violence. And that violence can be between people of different communities inside what was the former empire, as was the case with partition, obviously, in India in 1947. Think of another example, like the French colony of Algeria. Think about the war that France ended up fighting against Algerian guerrillas and terrorist groups that carried on many years after the French had left the Algerian colony. So, and even in Kenya with the Mau Mau rebellion, all these examples, when empires end, it is quite common that there are some fragilities within society that have been held down by the imperial elite that unleash themselves, or that the empire ended because there was a violent resistance movement that kicked out the empire. That didn't happen, of course, in India directly, but it certainly is the case in, in Algeria. Another example from, from the UK is Northern Ireland. Look at the violence of the IRA. Now, isn't it interesting that when Ukraine became independent in 1991, there was no violence, no large scale violence between Russian and Ukrainian speakers in Ukraine, nor was there any fighting between Russia and Ukraine. And incidentally, there was in a different part of the USSR and Central Asia, where Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, I'm not an expert in those areas, but there was some unrest in some of those areas. Uh, and there was unrest you know, in Nagorno-Karabakh. There are different parts of the former USSR that had violence, but Ukraine did not have violence. And there are many reasons why I've been reading some more books about Ukraine's independence. Some of them talk about the fact that Ukrainians were the second most represented uh, minority in the USSR's hierarchy. Because also numerically, even today, there's 180, I think, million Russians, 45 million Ukrainians. Ukraine's population has actually declined for a variety of reasons in the last 20, 30 years. There are 50 or so million Ukrainians at independence. There are a lot of Ukrainians in the Soviet army, in the Soviet bureaucracy. Even, um, this is an interesting, less serious fact, uh, the first Olympic Games that Russia contested, uh, I forget which, it might have been Barcelona, 1992, the first Olympic Games that Russia contested after the USSR collapsed. The Olympic Committee allowed Russia to feel like a unified Russian team, still with athletes from the USSR, because presumably those athletes would have trained as Soviet Union, then it ended, and then they have to go to the Olympics. Ukrainian athletes won a very large number of the Russian team's medals in the 1992 Olympics. And I, I don't mean that that says that they were best friends. I, I'm obviously a visitor in that region, but certainly there were some bonds. There was close integration, and it meant that there was a very slow unraveling 
of, of the integration between Russia and Ukraine. And those examples I've given you from 1991 to 2004 is the first really big indication that there is a, a fracture because part of Ukraine wants to integrate with the West. And of course, Russia hasn't moved socially and psychologically in the same direction as the West, as we know. It is very, it's a very traditional place in its own traditions. It's not interested in, in the globalized modernity that maybe we all take for granted in Europe or uh, Western Europe and the USA. Uh, the other thing I think that changed in terms of the evolution of this post-imperial relationship, which is the big theme in the book I've written about this situation, is the first two presidents in Ukraine, Kuchma and Kravchuk, uh, the two Leon, their both first name was Leonid, both of them had the same first name. Interesting fact, they were both born in the 1930s, and I believe both of their fathers had died fighting for the Soviet Union in World War II, presumably it'd be against the, the, the Nazis. That doesn't mean to say that they thought the same things, but they again had a Soviet nostalgia, a Soviet heritage, a family heritage of sacrifice for the Soviet motherland. And it meant that when they negotiated with Boris Yeltsin and with Putin, I think there was maybe more of a common language that they could talk on the basis of. Uh, one of those two, Leonids, uh, his business was running, I think, a, a factory in Dnipropetrovsk, the city I mentioned, a rocket factory, again, for the Soviets and then for independent Ukraine. So I think there was a sort of a socialist underpinning as well to how he behaved. When you get to 2004 and Viktor Yushchenko, the man who was poisoned, the pro-Western candidate, you then have the first of the presidents who come from a different generation of Ukrainians. I think Yushchenko was born in the 1950s. And that 20, 25 year generational difference meant that he probably grew up in the 80s and the 90s in, in terms of becoming more mature at a time when the USA the UK, Western Europe was really becoming very dominant in the world. The USSR clearly collapsed. And so you can see why there was a generational change. I'm, I'm a big fan when I'm analyzing post-imperial evolutions and relationships to so look at the generational changes. Uh, even in my own country in the UK, the fact Rishi Sunak is prime minister is a really big indication of a very big generational change compared to when my parents came to the UK in the 70s. Post-imperial relationships take time. They can go in very different directions. But back to Ukraine and to bring my comments uh, sort of to the final chapter. When I uh, uh, when, when this broke out in 2014 and uh, the pro-Russian candidate who refused to sign the EU deal was kicked out by the protests, uh, the Russian military clearly initiated a plan to annex Crimea this is in March 2014, that they probably had planned in their heads already, because one of the bizarre peculiarities of the independence of Ukraine was, as you all know from the news now, Russia uses the naval base in Crimea, in Sevastopol, as its Black Sea naval fleet headquarters. And after independence in 1991, when Crimea went to independent Ukraine, the Russians did a deal with the independent Ukrainian uh, president to lease that naval base. So Russia paid rent, to put it in simple terms, to independent Ukraine to keep their fleet stationed at Sevastopol. So there were already Russian sailors and Marines and soldiers in Crimea when they conducted the annexation that you all know about, which wasn't a very bloody encounter. They took the Ukrainian garrison by surprise and Ukraine lost Crimea Next March, by the way, it will be 10 years, one decade, since Russia annexed Crimea. And that was Putin's grand statement, I think, to his own people, let alone to the West, that Russia is no longer on a downward trajectory after the end of the Cold War. Russia can't be dictated to, and Russia is out to reclaim some of its old imperial prestige, which is a really strange thought. You certainly don't see Britain or France re-annexing former dominions or colonies. But that's, I think, a function, by the way, one more reflection on the difference between empires of maritime empire, where when you decolonize and you give independence or you lose control, obviously the British are a very far distance away from India 
from Kenya, uh, from Cyprus, from all the other, Hong Kong, Singapore, I'm sitting now, all the other former parts of the British Empire. France, even if it's only across the Mediterranean, is still away from Algeria. But when you are decolonizing a land empire, you are always still right next to, right next to, eye to eye with your former colony. And that creates some very difficult issues to manage. The other, of course, obvious point is it's only 30 years since the end of the USSR. So someone like Putin, who was personally you know, involved in the Russian security state that ran the Soviet Union, will have his own emotional relationship with what that means. Anyhow, I will talk just a bit about the Donbass war and uh, one final reflection on the wider ramifications of, of the, the war as it's uh, uh, carried on since 2022. So in 2014, I, I was now working for the UK Foreign Office. And because of my previous experience in Ukraine, I managed to get a, a role uh, being based in Donbass for about one year, where I was part of a big mission with hundreds of observers. Again, another international mission, this time to observe the ceasefire which was obviously not being adhered to. You may have heard in the news a lot of discussion or from your own knowledge of the Minsk process. Uh, after the war broke out in 2014, after Crimea was annexed, uh, and, and actually after MH17, the Malaysian airliner was shot down by what was almost certainly a Russian surface to air missile, there was a big diplomatic effort to try to halt the fighting. And the fighting was very active in Donetsk and Luhansk, in particular, where there were some pro-Russian separatist uprisings that were clearly funded and supported by uh, the Russian military as well. Uh, the mission I was part of was part of the ceasefire monitoring on a daily basis of whether the parties who had agreed on paper through the Minsk process, Minsk being the capital of Belarus, which was where the negotiations took place, uh, to withdraw their weapons and to de-escalate the fighting not to solve the whole thing, uh, that didn't get adhered to. But what happened was after the first year of the conflict, which was quite active, and some of the cities that you are now very familiar with, because they're globally famous from this war, were already subject to fighting in 2014-15. Uh, Bakhmut, the very famous city that was the focal point of the Russian offensive for eight months until early this year, was formerly called Artemivsk, which was it's the Ukrainians renamed it to be less associated with Russia. Fighting was happening around there. Avdivka, which is a city that Russia is trying to encircle right now, that's where the current Russian offensive is, has been at the front line of the fighting since 2014. Mariupol on the southern coast, the port city that the Russians flattened late last year or mid last year to take over, came under serious threat in 2015. There was fighting. On the outskirts of the city, the citizens were putting sandbags up. It's really important to remember that the fighting, certainly in the East, did not come out of nowhere in 2022 uh, when the full scale invasion began, but has been ongoing since the uh, limited invasion began. I think that's quite a useful uh, vocabulary. I would describe 2014 as a more limited invasion by the Russians. Uh, where they tried to deny any involvement in taking Crimea. If you remember, they lied and said that made up some story. They lied about shooting down the Malaysian airliner. And they said that the uprisings in Donetsk and Luhansk in the east were local rebellions against the deposing of the pro-Russian president, the president in Kiev. But of course, they denied their own support to it. When I left Ukraine, I was, I was there for one year. Um, I was always in touch with my friends who were still carrying on, of course, my Ukrainian colleagues who were help, who were translators, interpreters, who were basically the people without whom we could not have done this job, driving to different parts of the front line, talking to people, talking to Ukrainian soldiers in trenches. I spent some time in Donetsk city, which is occupied by the separatists. There you're talking to the separatists. There were Russian soldiers there. There was a Russian general there, unarmed. Uh, that Ukrainians allowed into the east of Ukraine, which is a very particular thing I won't go into in detail here. Um, when I left in late 2015, uh, the by coincidence, the Russians invaded Syria the same month. I was just getting on the aeroplane to go home back to London, I opened up the newspaper, and the Russians had just started bombing Syria. This is September 2015. And I think 
Russia's attention switched to the Middle East. I think the world's attention switched away from Ukraine. And the conflict in Ukraine went from a very high tempo conflict to a much lower tempo conflict. And it festered in that state of un being impossible to resolve until Putin uh, gambled on his full scale invasion that we've all followed in, in a lot of detail in 2022. Two final thoughts. One is, uh, before we have sort of more of a discussion, uh, just on the 2022 invasion, one is on the global response. Uh, I have been really taken aback that I think one of the most significant developments uh, from the 2022 invasion has been the, the very diverse global reaction to it, which we can talk about in, in the discussion. It's not the case that every part of the world has taken the same opinion over this. And even you know, in countries like Japan, South Korea and Singapore, where I'm sitting, these are some of the Asian countries that have sanctioned Russia over its invasion. Uh, there are still interesting contrasts of opinion. Uh, even in Singapore, uh, public comments by one minister said, even though Russia is fully to blame for this invasion, we cannot treat NATO as, as bystanders, uh, which means the presentation of this conflict as being totally uh, Putin's mission uh, is one way of portraying the conflict. It, I think, would be unwise to remove the idea that what Ukraine was trying to do was to try to westernize its foreign policy, to join the, these Western clubs. It was arguably let down by the West because they were told you could join NATO one day, but until they joined, of course, they had no protection from NATO, which is why you know, they've gone to war to defend their country, to reclaim their land, to kick out occupation. It's awful what's happening in Ukraine. And they've paid such a huge price to try to defend their territory. Um, but they are not being helped on the ground by NATO soldiers fighting with them. They're fighting on their own with NATO equipment that's being given to them. And that is a very, very difficult situation because, you know, as we'll talk about, one of the issues Ukraine faces now is manpower, people power. As a smaller country compared to Russia, it has only its own citizens and a few foreign volunteers to fight on its behalf. The second point uh, I want to make is about uh, the possible sort of longer term outcomes to, oh, just one more point on the Asia point is of course that Putin has survived the sanctions because the world economy is in a different state to 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the G7 economies of the West and Japan held I think 60% of global GDP. They now hold I think less than 50%. Obviously the BRICS countries hold a rising share of global GDP, which means clearly if the West sanctions you, you go to alternatives like China. And I say that because Putin is in Beijing today at the Belt and Road Forum, where he is praising his Chinese host for the Belt and Road Initiative. That was a few hours ago. You have other places to go. And you know, Russia's economy has been hammered by the sanctions. They've lost access to, you know, I've I know people in Russia who say they can't travel because they can't use their credit cards because the visa system won't use, allow for their credit cards. So Russia has been shut off from the Western financial infrastructure. 600 billion, uh, I think, US dollars worth of Russian foreign assets have been frozen. That means Russian assets held, I think, in US dollars outside of Russian territory. For example, money in South Korea or elsewhere, they can't, Russia can't access that money. But Russia's economy is still surviving. And that is a really, really important development in terms of thinking about future international relations, future conflicts, the power of the West being different to what it was 30 years ago. Final reflection on how this possibly ends. Um, I did make a prediction in my book. Uh, I think uh, with, again, my bigger picture historical view of the history of empires, I know, and I'm talking to, you're, 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 you're joining me from India, of course, we all know that the end of empires can lead to changes in borders. It can lead to chaotic and disastrous and bloody changes in borders that no one wanted, no one planned, but because the empire was of a particular size and shape, and there's a particular ideology behind that empire, and when it collapsed and the problems began, uh, the people have to adjust to a different reality. Ukraine never had to, luckily never had to do that. 
until I think in the near future, because I don't think the Ukrainian military is going to be strong enough to kick the Russians out of every square inch of occupied Ukrainian territory. That's not me saying I don't want them to. I'm just trying to tell you the obvious, which is the counteroffensive, which began in the summer, that you all follow on the news, has had very modest gains. The Russians have got enough reserves to mount their own offensive around Avdivka three days ago. So they obviously have the ability to carry on. If neither side can win, you end up with a situation, some people talk about North and South Korea, where you never have a, a formal end to the conflict, but you have an armistice line. The example I actually picked in my book, uh, which you may not be as familiar with, is actually divided Cyprus. Just very quickly, when the British Empire ended and Cyprus uh, became an independent entity, there was a military coup, uh, which uh, and there was a possible attempt to join Greece. And this is 1974, it's a long time, it's before I'm alive. Turkey invaded and captured one third of Cyprus and never left. And this was one of my other jobs, actually, before I went to Ukraine when I worked for the, the Foreign Office. I, I worked for a year or less than a year on the Cyprus peace process, which is a bit of a joke peace process because there's no resolution. No one's going to reunify Cyprus. I think the Turkish have 40,000 soldiers in the Turkish part of Cyprus, which is that one third that they took. The front line is an insane. I had a tour with the UN uh, peacekeepers who... Uh, uh, it's called the Green Line. There's a shop inside that Green Line, which was literally abandoned when the Turkish invaded and the Cypriots there ran away. There's a car showroom with 1970s sports cars just gathering dust with cobwebs growing over them, plants growing over them, because the car shop owner ran away when the Turkish invaded in 1974. And the fighting stopped. I don't know in detail about that war. But Turkey, even if Turkey wanted to take over all of the island, they failed. No one has ever resolved that conflict. And in the end, in 2004, the Greek Cypriot part joined the European Union. And at the UN, they've done a very interesting thing where the UN technically recognizes all of Cyprus, even though the government of Cyprus only controls 70% of it. And the 30% the Turkish control called the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is not recognized by anybody except Turkey in sovereign terms. That is a future thought as to what may happen, sadly, with Ukraine five, 10 years from now. I don't think it's impossible that Central and West Ukraine one day just does join the European Union, maybe 20 years time, 10 years time, who knows, but that there is a part of Ukraine that they can't recapture. And it's not a formal partition. It's not a de jure partition, but it's a de facto partition. Now, I could be wrong. Suddenly the Ukrainians could pick up momentum and they could recapture more and more of their territory. But it doesn't look that way, I have to say, especially given the possibility that Trump could come back into power in America. And then, as I'm sure you all know from the news, the Republicans may not be willing to spend 50 billion US dollars in the space of two years uh, paying for Ukraine's war, uh, which is a huge amount of money. And I don't think when you factor in how much Ukraine's reconstruction will also cost, which may be paid for by the Europeans more, uh, you realize that Ukraine is in a very, very fragile, very sad, very damaged state uh, for its people, its infrastructure and the sheer number of uh, people who have been injured, people who have now been amputees, all of this is going to take a very long time to rehabilitate Ukraine whenever the fighting stops. So I've talked a bit longer than I expected, but I'll, I'll just stop there for discussion and questions. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Puri. It was really enlightening to hear you talk about your first-hand experience you had in Ukraine during many of the conflicts and the intractable nature of this dispute and the impact of the war in Asia. So uh, with that, I would like to ask you a few questions and then pass it over to the audience for the Q&A session. So uh, actually, the war has been going on for 600 days as of now, and many attempts to bring down the war has substantially failed, actually. 
So meanwhile, uh, according to some est uh, estimates, the number of soldiers killed and wounded has exceeded half a million casualties, and sanctions have also did uh, did not provide much success. Uh, so when we look at the public opinion in the West and in the Russia, it is actually contrasting. That is what we can see right now. So while some uh, US public opinion on Ukraine has waned, uh, Russian officials and media continue to ad advocate for Ukraine's uh, destruction, which influence public sentiment in Russia. So in this context, uh, do you think negotiations uh, still play a bigger role uh, in potentially ending the war in Ukraine? And we probably we probably might have missed a few opportunities in ending the war, but uh, do you think there are any alternative or new solutions or negotiations left to try out to bring peace in Ukraine? That's a really good question. Something that people, I think, forget now, because so much has happened in Ukraine, is there was a failed negotiation attempt back in March 2022, so weeks after the invasion began. Putin dispatched a man called... Viktor uh, Medensky, I think his name, was a former culture minister, to be his chief negotiator. And they met the Ukrainian uh, presidential advisor in Belarus, not in Minsk. They went to a, a forest location. They met face to face. But I think the Russians were so arrogant that they thought they would flatten the Ukrainian military and capture Kiev straight away. I think he thought, the Russian negotiator thought he would impose a victor's peace, as in these are our terms of surrender. But because the Ukrainians fought back, back and back, uh, that negotiation never really went anywhere. It then moved to mediation and the Turkish government mediated. You'll know the Turkish have actually maintained a, a, a middle position where they're supplying Ukraine with armed drones, but they're not sanctioning Russia. And I, I, so we understand there are record numbers of Russian tourists going to Turkey still. So you can see that Russia, uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine both feel they can talk to Turkey. So Turkey brought uh, Kubela and Lavrov, the foreign ministers of, U of Ukraine and Russia, I think to Antalya in Turkey in March 2022. And there was a, and they, they think they call it, you know, the Istanbul proposals. Uh, there was a, a, a hint that Zelensky would agree to not join NATO, for Ukraine to not join NATO if there was a possibility of a peaceful solution. But it turns out the Russians were still absolutely, I think, maximalist on their demands. And so the negotiations went nowhere. And again, the other thing we also have found out is that Boris Johnson, when he was British president, advised Zelensky to not negotiate and to fight. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, that Boris Johnson, who wrote a book about Winston Churchill, would have told Zelensky, you are the 21st century Winston Churchill fighting the dictators. Don't surrender. Don't think you're alone. Fight on. So for all the re reasons we understand in those critical weeks in March and April 2022, when Kiev was being defended, uh, there was this negotiation which collapsed. Now, your next point question is, could you have negotiations in the future? Very hard now, because the US and the UK and other Eastern European countries are 100% against negotiation. And they say they're 100% against it because they say Zelensky is 100% against it. And this is problematic. I think it's problematic. Uh, I understand why, because they say the Russians are liars. So any agreement they sign, they will break. They will point to the Minsk process that I was part of, where the Russians effectively deceived the Ukrainians for 10, uh, eight years or so and didn't really move the situation forward meaningfully in the negotiations. And the final point is so much blood has been spilled, there's so much anger, hurt, and bitterness that the feeling of no compromise is very strong, it's very palpable. And I, I don't understand quite what you do with that now. The, the people who write about when negotiations begin, there's an academic called William Zartman, Z-A-R-T-M-A-N, an American academic, uh, who wrote many books about negotiations. And one of his famous observations was for conflicts to move from high tempo violence to negotiation, you have to first reach a mutually hurting stalemate, which means on the battlefield, even though neither side wishes to surrender, neither side can win. And enough time passes that the understanding becomes second nature, that the longer we go on with this, the nothing we're, we're going to gain nothing. Even America in Vietnam, for example, finally negotiated an exit uh, 
in the Paris talks, which with Henry Kissinger and, and Nixon, but it took them six or seven years to get there. Because, and look at the uh, the Americans in Afghanistan, they didn't give up for 20 years. So you can see how in all sorts of conflicts, it can take a very, very long time for any kind of uh, realization to come that negotiation is viable. But it's, it doesn't look good at the moment, I have to say, in terms of negotiation. It looks like there'll be at least another, at least more fighting into next year. Because the Ukrainian counteroffensive this year has failed, as Zelensky has said, we're just preparing the ground for next year. So unfortunately, I think no end in sight of the fighting. Thank you so much, Dr. Puri, for that insightful comment. Uh, so uh, with respect to your talk, you have mentioned about the sanctions imbo imposed by the West on Russia. Uh, actually, Russia has shut off the Western financial system, uh, yet Russian economy is uh, still surviving. So when sanctions were imposed on Russia uh, by the West in order to stop Russia from getting funds to continue the war, we can see that it was not really successful. Uh, even though the oil prices have risen and uh, has destabilized the oil market, at the same time, you you was indirectly purchasing Russian oil through India, which India got at a discounted price. So uh, India's external affairs uh, minister, S. Jayashankar, has also mentioned that uh, rules are different for different players and they are defined at their convenience for the situations uh, I have mentioned uh, about. So what is your take on this? Okay, that's a, that's a really important point. As, as I said in my opening comments, the reaction globally uh, to this war, Russia's invasion, has been really illuminating and there's uh, one question as well online, I'll just uh, from Rajdeep, who's asked, um, is, is the Ukrainian conflict in some way the beginning of a sort of Cold War conflict between China and the West led by the USA? The, to bring that question into your question as well about world order, definitely I'm a big believer that compared to when I was in high school and finishing university, you know, the 90s, the early 2000s, compared to now, the world is much more multipolar than it was uh, back even 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And I think people in the West haven't noticed how multipolar the world is. And Jai Shankar in particular is a good embodiment of this. He's not the only one. On the point about oil, remember when Joe Biden flew to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia last year and asked for an increase in OPEC's oil production so the oil price would go down and Russia would, I guess, make less money from oil. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia refused. And MBS and Saudi Arabia are actually quite close to Russia in controlling uh, the, the global oil supply. Obviously, the Middle East and Russia are two of the biggest oil producers in the world. I don't think they were doing that to, you know, to, you know, to directly uh, humiliate America, but it's interesting how little power America had over Saudi Arabia on this question of oil production. Joy Shankar is, as you know better than me, is a very sharp individual. And I'll never forget a press conference I watched on, on YouTube where he was in Brussels and someone accused uh, India of being immoral by buying uh, Russian gas and oil. And he immediately read from the EU's own rules, which said that if crude is sourced from one country but refined in a second country, it is no longer considered as being from the source country. So therefore, uh, buying uh, crude that may have been produced from Russia but refined elsewhere does not count as buying Russian petrol. It's a technical argument, but I thought it was interesting. Um, I do think that the West, certainly America, arguably also Britain, probably NATO, has not yet realized how multipolar the world is becoming. Uh, and I think there's an obsession with the rise of China. There's a characterization of, of Russia as insignificant. But look at the behavior of Saudi Arabia, look at the behavior of Turkey, look at the behavior of some of the Gulf states, look at Indonesia, look at Brazil. They've all had very individual reactions to this. And some of these countries understandably remember that America invaded Iraq in 2003 and see there's a double standard and a hypocrisy. Again, this is not my personal view. They also don't accept that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a unique conflict. They see wars all over the world. And Jai Shankar as well made a very good statement that if you're talking to me about values, where were these Western values when you abandoned Afghanistan to the Taliban uh, and you had Afghans falling from, he didn't say this, but you remember the image, Afghans falling from the, the wheels of an American 
C-130 transport plane. And that, uh, that issue doesn't have much traction to people in London or America. They think about Afghanistan from 9-11. They think about it from the perspective of their soldiers, but it's not their neighborhood. But Ukraine is in Europe. So maybe Europeans certainly feel uh, that much more closely as an issue. So I don't know. I just think that when historians look back at 2022, 2023, I think they might see this as one of the key moments when non-Western parts of the world started taking more independent views about issues that previously the West may have been able to monopolize the information space on. And you remember a final observation on this from even as recently as 15 years ago, an American president would stand at the podium and talk about the international community as the leader of the international community. Those days are, are gone. You, you never hear a Western leader use the term international community in the same way that you did 20, 30 years ago. But that's a bigger question about where the world is, is headed to, I think, in the immediate next sort of 5, 10, 15 years. Thank you, Dr. Puri. Uh, now we'll uh, take questions from the audience present in CPPR here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Puri. Actually, my question is, as you know, when the Soviet Union broke up, there were many Russians who felt that Ukraine and Belarus were part of their culture and very much linked to them. Of course, after the breakup, I found the Russians have changed uh, you know, and located some centers of culture within what is today Russia. But otherwise, Ukraine and uh, Belarus, they thought very much part of it. So how did, I mean, you touched upon it. How do you think that, uh, you know, they came to such a state because there are lots of people within Russia who feel sympathetic to Ukraine. And is it that Putin has yeah. been too long there that he realized that, you know, nobody can touch him? What is your feelings or what is your opinion on this? Oh, it's a good question because definitely Putin has been there for too long. I mean, there are Russians now who are you know, 25 year old Russians. They've, they've literally never known anything other than Putin being president or prime minister. So he, was, he obviously took the job in 1999, 2000. So one very specific point which I your question raises which is really really important is you know when you spend 30 years in the same job you tend to operate with some outdated understandings of the world I, I it's very clear that Vladimir Putin has a very outdated view of what how Ukrainians think about the world and it, it seems quite clear from you know reporting in the Washington Post and other places that have looked at you know captured Russian pre-invasion plans there was an expectation that the Russians had that Ukrainian some would rise up to want to accept the invasion by Russia. And maybe some did, but it must have been a very small minority because most of them either picked up arms and fought the Russians or just wished this would all end and they would go back to peace. There was no desire to re there's a desire from some people, but it must be a small minority. And remember also, I think about, I don't know what the updated figures are, but at least a million Ukrainians have fled into Russia as refugees when the fighting began. Probably because they are the most pro Russians and the ones who have family. The other point is there are clearly lots of uh, families that are Ukrainian Russian in the heritage, mixed heritage families. Uh, and so there are also those personal bonds. But you are right that Belarus and Ukraine were seen particularly close to Russia because there are probably I guess, hierarchical and ethnic perceptions in relation to Russia's Far East and Central Asia, which maybe by contrast saw Ukrainians and Belar Belarusians to be less dissimilar to Russians. Um, certainly, again, interesting when I was researching my book, I didn't realize that the formal signature to dissolve the USSR was achieved when the leaders of the Soviet republics of Belarus and the Soviet Republic of Ukraine met uh, I think Gorbachev and they all agreed to dissolve the USSR. Those three dissolved the USSR through their legal codification of that. But I do think, you know, as again, we're talking about generational change, it's perfectly reasonable for Ukrainians to look at the European Union and think it's a nicer place than Russia in terms of its economic prospects, its social connections, its, its stronger connections to, to, to America. But you can see that some parts of Ukraine and clearly the Russian leadership have been going in to totally different directions at different speeds. And this is clearly the basis of this intractable conflict. 
is you can't find a compromise now between these different opinions, which is why I feel some kind of pragmatic partition is probably the, on, the only way to de-escalate this in the near, in, it's in the medium term future. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few questions from the online as well. So I'll go in a mixed mode. So one question I'll take from the online now. So uh, it is question from Rajdeep. Uh, so he's asking, can we look at the Ukrainian conflict as the beginning of a sort of a new Cold War conflict between China and the West led by USA? Yeah, and I'll also add um, Shobit's question. Uh, do, you, do you think Ukraine war is being looked at by China with respect to a future invasion of Taiwan? Because they're both about uh, China. Now, these are very good questions. And uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on Taiwan. I did visit there late last year. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because there's a very obvious point, which is to invade Taiwan, you'd have to cross the water. Uh, but there are some there's some very superficial similarities. There's a Taiwanese island called Kinmen Island, which is actually not part of the main part of Taiwan. It's underneath uh, China's Xiamen province. It's so close you could swim between mainland China and this separate Taiwanese small island. And when I went there late last year, as a university in this uh, small Taiwanese island, they said we are the Crimea of Taiwan. And by that, they meant if there's ever a war, we'd be the first place to be occupied. I do think, though, that there's no real need for China to invade. Um, I think China can play the very long game about the further expansion of its economy. And in the immediate term, China is more concerned with who wins the 2024 election in Taiwan. It's not the same as in Ukraine, where there's a pro-China, anti-China candidate, but there are some similarities and they are everyone in who's looking at Taiwan, and the Americans as well. They're all very anxious uh, that the the less pro-China candidate wins. If the more pro-China candidate wins, then China can pursue a political strategy that doesn't necessarily have to involve invasion. And but the similarity in the situation is again, I think, to the previous gentleman's question is having outdated views of, of territory. I think. Uh, maybe the political elite in Beijing have a more outdated view of Taiwan than Taiwan actually respect, reflects, which is more young Taiwanese consider themselves to be Taiwanese, culturally Chinese, but have a separate national identity. And again, I think the problem there is China thinks that Taiwan is part of its historical territory, whereas it wasn't continuously part of Chinese territory for centuries gone by. Uh, the point about the Cold War, uh, I don't think it's quite the same as a co the difference with the Cold War to today is the Cold War had these big ideological blocks and it had a non-aligned movement. Today, I would say most of the world is not aligned in terms of this sort of you know standoff between China and the USA. I say that a part that is aligned is the G7 and NATO. They're very much aligned to the USA, but you know China and Russia they don't have a treaty alliance. They have a marriage of convenience because they're both under pressure from America and they're not unlike the USSR offering the rest of the world any ideology there's no Marxism that you could try to bring other countries into into your block so I think there's much more mixing and matching in most countries uh, middle-sized countries that are not in NATO or not with America they're trying to get benefits from both America and China and you know I mean India is a very good example. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with India's foreign policy, which is to have a lot of technology sharing deals with America. Obviously, Indians love going to Silicon Valley who work in tech. Uh, and they have these strong connections to America. At the same time, and this is a really interesting comment. I was at an event in Singapore. There was a retired Indian admiral who I don't remember his name. I won't give his identity. He was on the screen. He was joining from, I think, from Delhi. Someone criticized him uh, in the audience and they said, how can you possibly condone India continuing its defense relationship with Russia, given what Russia is doing in Ukraine? And he gave a very good answer, uh, very much a real politique answer. He said, just as America has a strategic relationship with Israel that goes through thick and thin, even if Israel does something very controversial, America always backs Israel. It's different for us, but we have a strategic relationship with Russia which endures despite what's happening today. 
And it was very much uh, an articulation of national interest over um, being told how to behave by the West and accepting that. And that, I think, is, is where it's very different to, I think, the Cold War. Rather than non-alignment, I think it's more about independence of decision-making based on, on national interest. And I do know, just the last comment on that, I do know that the Indian military is concerned about, understandably, uh, getting spare parts for all of its Russian equi Russian made equipment, whether it's T-72 tanks or you know, some of India's naval vessels that were sourced from Russia you know, many years ago. Uh, there's a, obviously a problem because the Russian military is so bogged down in Ukraine. Russia, as you know, is now buying ammunition from North Korea. So obviously, if you're a client of, of Russia's defense industry, you'd be very concerned that when you ask for spare parts, nothing will come. So understandably, India will pursue more self-sufficiency in its defense procurement and probably look to diversify and buy more from the West, maybe buy from Japan, uh, maybe buy from uh, France, from UK, from wherever else. So I think that's, that is a lasting consequence for India, but that doesn't mean India has to turn its back on Russia. I just think it may be a bit less dependent on Russia for, for its defense sourcing. Hence, it's definitely not a Cold War because you can go in both directions in one go, even if it makes the Americans angry. Yeah, okay. well, just last anecdote on that. You remember when uh, India was going to buy the S-400 air defense system from Russia, and then in Washington, uh, the American Congress talked about sanctioning India for buying uh, this Russian air defense system. And I think, I don't know if they went ahead and bought it, but certainly India was very, very strong enough to want to ignore America's anger over buying this Russian air defense system. So again, there's a lot of mixing and matching going on. So now we can take a question from here. Uh, so before asking question, can you please introduce yourself, sir? Uh, I am a retired civil servant. My name is Thomas. My question, thank you very much for your uh, endless presentation because you have worked there as an election observer and also with the peacekeeping operations there in uh, Ukraine and other parts. My question is mainly centered on the humanitarian and aspects that is uh, in Ukraine. For example, a lot of refugees during the protracted war from the 2004 you have mentioned about, a lot of refugees have now come up. What about the rehabilitation and resettlement of the, these refugees? Perhaps you may be knowing that well aware of that EU countries and especially in the Baltic and Balkans, with a lot of ethnic groups having good relations with the Putin, the Russian administration. They are against the accommodation or the rehabilitation of the, two, of the refugees, especially from Ukraine. So, so much pressure is mounting up from countries like, for example, Poland, Moldova, then so many countries of the Balkan and Baltic. In such a situation, how the West, particularly the European Union and other countries, will tackle the problem of refugees, their rehabilitation and settlement? That is the question number one. The second question is your on-the-ground experience in the Ukraine. A lot of reports are coming up. For, a, for example, the nuclear projects are under attack. If the war, there will be a protracted war, and it will be prolonged for time. And a lot of you know, high range, high range the missiles of US is coming. The latest is that uh, last uh, couple of days, US missiles have been used by Ukrainian forces. In such an eventuality, what about the destruction of the infrastructure? For example, nuclear plant that's uh, out the Nelder in the Kokova that is a major dam was bursted. In such a situation, the total devastation of the Ukraine, if the war is prolonged, and if there is any nuclear problem, what will be the fate of the millions of people in Ukraine? And whether the US and the West is responsible for this type of genocide? Oh, th thank you for the two questions. So the issue with refugees is huge because uh, millions of Ukrainians have understandably left Ukraine. Um, some of my Ukrainian friends, uh, I include that in, in their numbers and people I've spoken to uh, with very difficult stories of, of, of course, leaving their homes. Um, the issue of refugees and the issue of uh, infrastructure destruction, I think the evolving understanding in the West is whereas the Americans have paid a lot for the Ukrainian military support, I think there's an understanding that the European Union and presumably also the UK would pay a, a bigger share for the reconstruction costs going forward. 
Um, I haven't been in Europe during this invasion, by the way, so I can't give you any personal insights to the last year and a half. But just the things that you hear, um, I, I spoke to someone from a, the German government, a civil servant, and he was telling me that one of the, the complications they have is funding reconstruction projects while the fighting carries on. If you do that, there's obviously a lot of pessimism that the thing you reconstruct could be destroyed by a Russian missile. And there's real, I think, difficulty in beginning some of the reconstruction work foreign funded until there's some kind of end to the fighting, which, as you've said, doesn't look like it will be any time soon. Uh, in terms of the Zaporizhia nuclear reactor, um, certainly with the US long range missile, I think they are using the uh, cluster munitions rather than like a, a more specific high explosive. So one would hope that that would at least reduce the possibility uh, of that happening. But I don't also think there's been fighting, from what I understand, around the nuclear reactor area, specifically in, in the recent months. There was a, an effort by international nuclear monitors to gain access to the, from the IAEA, to gain access to the nuclear site to monitor its stability. But I agree, it's a very, very worrying situation. Um, people have very different views over this. Some people prioritize ending the fighting as quickly as possible. Other people prioritize Ukraine's victory in the fighting. I think based on the issues that you uh, raise, you can see why I think it's a very difficult moral question uh, uh, answering that definitively one way or the other. And I can see why people feel one and what other people feel the other, which is which is the biggest moral imperative to bring the fighting to an end and to start to think about reconstruction and stability or, or to keep helping Ukraine fight in, in the hope of a greater Ukrainian victory. I can't answer that question, but I think we'll all have individual opinions on this. So uh, we can take a question from online now. Uh, so Professor Iswan is asking, how do you see the relationship between the war in Ukraine and the present conflict in Israel and Palestine? Uh, do we see here a globalization of the conflict in Ukraine? Yeah, that, there is definitely a relationship, but I, I wouldn't say globalization. One has not caused the other. Um, and I don't think the Russians have had anything to do with the Israel-Palestine escalation. But certainly Putin is a big winner from it because it diverts American attention. I mean, Biden, all of his attention is now taken up on his trip to the Middle East, which has become very difficult, as you know from the news. There's only you know one Secretary of Defense, there's only one Secretary of State, they have to have their attention placed in one place or another. Um, there's another question, by the way, about ammunition supplies, which is a uh, which we can come to. But certainly, you know, if Israel asks for America's help in providing certain types of ammunition, that will stress the American defense industry in a way that no one could have predicted as recently as two weeks ago or one and a half weeks ago. But I think the biggest consequence for Ukraine is if Israel-Palestine ends up being a very long conflict and that carries on at this level of controversy and loss of life and distress, it's distressing even for people outside of Israel. I mean, seeing the footage of Israelis being kidnapped, seeing the footage of people being killed in the Gaza Strip, as a human being, it's very hurtful. And that also has consequence for Ukraine because previously global sympathy was with Zelensky, and it was with Ukrainians. And people still feel sympathy for Ukrainians, but their sympathy has been diverted to feeling sympathy for other people. And of course, as you know, around the world, sometimes people feel more sympathy for some foreigners than they do for other foreigners. That's just the way we are as people and how we, how we uh, construct our identity. Zelensky, I think, would be very worried. There was a brief report in the press, Zelensky offered to go to Israel to, to offer his personal support. Clearly, he just wanted to get back on television because he wants to keep Ukraine as the current concern. I think the Israelis told him to not come. That might just be a rumor. But I think ultimately, it's very bad news for the Ukrainians. It's potentially good news for Russia because it removes a bit of international attention from what they're doing there. Uh, do we have any questions from here? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Hi. Uh, 
So my question is more about like, you know, how the war in Ukraine has changed uh, in the geopolitics of Asia. So here I have one, two things that I want to focus is on. One is like the growing access between China and uh, Russia. So we already discussed here. So also there's one aspect that I would like to hear more insight is like how the war in Ukraine is as accelerating uh, Beijing's policies that designed to reduce the dependencies on Western financial institutions. So we have like, you know, the uh, like such deals like rupee ruble deal and all uh, and also how Russia is focusing depending more on the uh, Chinese currency to overcome the sanctions and all this. So that's changing the geopolitical as well as geoeconomic situations of Asia. And another aspect is like with changing uh, issues in this, especially with the Hamas Palestine, uh, Hamas Israel issue. We have like, you know, US foreign policy is also changing. And now the US has to focus more into the Middle East uh, than it was. So all these things is changing the Asian geopolitics as well. So how how do you look at it? Yeah, so the point about Middle East we've already talked about. The point about uh, currency is very interesting. Certainly, I think Russia, Ukraine, we all know this from how we study history. Sometimes a dramatic single event accelerates trends that we already saw moving more slowly. And I mean, I would call it... Uh, uh, de-westernization it's not so much anti-western but it's it, we all know that the world is heavily dominated by western financial institutions we know that the us dollar is i think you know the most traded currency in the world and i would certainly to answer your question rather than only talking about asia i would talk about the brics summit brazil russia india china that happened in and south africa that happened in johannesburg in august where again these world leaders were discussing and modi was there as well they were discussing not only uh, uh, trading, as you say, rupee, ruble, uh, or yuan, uh, rupee, or whatever, you, however you might want to de denominate the trade. There was even talk about a BRICS currency, which you know, a lot of people ridiculed and said this is never going to happen, and it doesn't seem like it's a likely prospect. But definitely it will accelerate the attempts by the Chinese government to uh, detach itself from the Western uh, global economy, and at least to be able to manage some self-sufficiency, because I think the thing that the Chinese will be the most scared about is I, I mentioned that the estimate of 600, uh, 600 million um, uh, dollars of Russian foreign assets. I think the amount of uh, Chinese foreign assets is, is considerably larger, actually. So they will be very worried that if there's ever a war over Taiwan, uh, then they will actually be uh, not unable to access a significant amount of uh, China's wealth. So that's a, that's a very, very big concern that uh, the Chinese will have, is that they may actually think that uh, they could be sanctioned by uh, the USA in the same way that the uh, the Russians have been. 600 billion, sorry, not 600 million, 600 billion uh, dollars of Russian foreign assets. I think the Chinese amount of foreign assets is in the trillions, because obviously it's a much bigger economy. And the Americans, I suppose, could technically stop China from accessing that money. Other things I think you'll see, which is also part of how the world is moving on, are lots of trade deals involving major non-Western countries with each other. And you know, China and Iran have conducted a lot of, uh, have promised to increase their trade, for example. And that's another example, the way I suppose China would make itself more confident that it could not be sanctioned uh, so so debilitatingly by the West if there was a, a war in five years or seven years' time. Uh, so Dr. Shakila Shamsu has a question. Uh, do you see this conflict stretching interminably due to the ideological divide of communism and capitalism? Uh, how do you view this as not just a hard war and more, on, more an ideological one? Yeah. So I, I don't think there's a communist... Capitalist thing. I mean, Russia is not not really is not communist anymore. I think uh, yeah, China is more communist than Russia, and even China isn't that communist anymore. Definitely, the ideology. This is also part of the question: is is an imperial ideology, and I think again, we all know this from our general knowledge. 
empires have an ideology that runs. I mean, the, the Raj in, in India had an ideology of colonialism that a certain type of British person embodied. And the imperial class in Russia is clearly still active in its elite. So I think the ideology is of empire. And the ideology is that uh, Russia is the senior controlling partner. Ukraine is the smaller subjugated partner. And this is the natural balance. Ukraine could never be an equal. It could never be independent. It could never take its own decisions. Russia considers it to be part of its natural property. It's a very outdated, old-fashioned ideology. Uh, I think imperial ideologies generally in the 2020s uh, stand out as being almost from the 19th century. But certainly that's why this conflict is also intractable, is you have this... Uh, Zelensky is a, is a fairly young man. He's, he, I think he was 11 years old when the Berlin Wall collapsed. So he obviously has a different way of thinking about things. Putin has this completely outdated ideology, which um, I don't even think in 30 years, if you have a very right wing Russian leader, I don't, I, didn't, I don't even think they would think like Putin does, because I think they would then be the post imperial generation, you know, a generation away from the USSR. But that is where I think the ideolo ideological problem comes in this conflict. I think, Paul, you may go ahead with your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Puri, in your book, uh... Uh, in your latest book, in fact, uh, I think it is in chapter five, you mention about corruption where you talk about uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, so, and very recently, as recent as uh, last August, we heard about uh, officers in the Ukrainian army being uh, you know, fired. You know, so maybe my question could be a little bit unorthodox, but is there some kind of a deep state in Ukraine which probably wants a war to continue? You know, it was interesting how you mentioned almost uh, three or four factors which, uh, you know, contribute to corruption leading to, you know, what is happening there. So, so uh, what do you feel about that? Yeah, um, the corruption point is very interesting. I'm not an expert on corruption uh, in Ukraine. I can only point to, as I wrote in the book, there's this uh, Transparency International has an index about countries and rates them on uh, assessments of corruption. And it's notable that uh, Russia and Ukraine are not in dissimilar rankings. Uh, even I certainly saw that you know, many of my Ukrainian friends expressed just everyday peacetime frustration with the way things like paying bribes in universities, for example, to finish your degrees. I mean, this is stories I heard. Um, I think in terms of the military conflict, I don't think anyone in Ukraine wants this war to carry on. That I don't think so. But ultimately, Ukraine is not a wealthy country. Ukrainians are not, on average, per capita, very wealthy. That's, of course, why they wanted to join the EU, some of them, because eventually your level of wealth rises. Uh, but I think, um, and of course, people's standard of living will be even worse because there's a war going on, so they can't access things, the currency has lost value and everything else. I think the specific issue you mentioned where the Ukrainians involved in recruiting soldiers were fired by Zelensky's government was because they were basically accepting bribes by Ukrainian men to avoid military conscription. So they were being given medical exemptions and uh, travel exemptions so they can leave. That's a problem, uh, but certainly it's a problem that I think also indicates one of Ukraine's vulnerabilities in the prolongation of the war, which is that they are fighting a country with a much bigger population. Neither country has another ally coming in to join with their foreign nationals as well, officially. So the Ukrainians have got a pool where they've probably recruited all of their willing volunteers. They've now got people who are understandably very, and I don't, I'm not making a judgment on this, but I'm sure there are many Ukrainian men who have seen their friends killed and, you know, and, and critically injured, and not all of them will want to go to the front. Some of them will have different reactions to this. So that, that was the issue there, I think, was uh, increasing and maintaining Ukrainian military recruitment so that their, their huge losses, as we heard from the earlier question, can be replenished. And the final point on this is one of the major criteria for Ukraine joining the European Union is making big reforms against corruption inside of its system. Again, I'm not an expert in how that's conducted, but there were efforts even before this invasion to do that sort of thing. Ukraine was administratively a very centralized country and there was a bit of an attempt to devolve a bit more power to its different 
regions. This is before the conflict. I don't know where that's got to now, but I think in the in times of war, uh, you know, obviously government, central government becomes very powerful. And I think peacetime anti-corruption reforms will probably be very different, but that's an ongoing long-term project. So since we are running short of time, I'll take one last question from online. So it is from Amrit Thakur. Uh, despite the West sanctioning Russian exports and choking the financial system, Moscow has still been able to sustain on its military funding. So can this be seen as a change in war management strategies between today and the erstwhile USSR? Yeah, um, it, this actually comes back to, and I'll, I'll also take the question from about the UN Security Council as well. That question, the first one, really comes down to that point about different economies uh, offering Ru uh, Russia other options. I was really amazed. I was, there's an old Economist article that explained that in 1990, the Chinese economy represented 4% of global GDP. I think if I remember correctly, I mean, you just compare that to now, 30, you know, two, three years later, how much of the global economy China accounts for. I think it's 15% now. India uh, accounts for an astronomically larger percentage of the global economy compared to 30 years ago, as you know, better than I do. So that is where I think Russia's economic and financial survival is coming from, is that changing balance of economic power. And just a last point about the UN Security Council. Uh, I mean, this is clearly yet more evidence that the UN Security Council is, is completely relevant to resolving problems that in, involve some of its own members. You know, the five members of the Security Council, if they have a dispute between themselves. The UN Security Council is paralyzed, it's useless. And I think we're only going to see um, the further paralysis of the UN Security Council like in years to come. Thank you, Dr. Puri. Uh, so uh, we have had a, such an invigorating uh, discussion today. Unfortunately, due to our time constraint, we are ending our Q&A session here. And before we conclude the talk, uh, I request uh, you to give your closing remarks on this talk. Yeah, I just want to say a really big thank you to listening and attending and for the invitation again. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, but I do think that's also a very sensible approach to take given that we're talking about Ukraine, you're sitting in India and I'm sitting in Singapore. Uh, it's been a, a, a conflict which has had global impact, but also I think illuminates very important global politics themes. I think the extent of which we're only going to see you know, in the years to come, but thank you again for listening. Thank you so much. And thank you all for the enthusiasm and engagement shown. So to summarize the session, uh, following are some of the key points of discussion today. Uh, the geopolitical chest uh, between West and Russia in the last two decades in Eastern Europe has led to the conflict in Ukraine. Since 2004, Russia has had the idea that West is trying to take Russia out of its orbit. And Russian perception is that elections are only accepted by the West if their fav favorite ruler comes into power. Uh, in the countries in Eastern Europe. The tug of power between uh, the two blocs has created this uh, geopolitical cross point. And Russia and U Ukraine's history is filled with a lot of violence and clashes. However, Russian and Ukraine history are also interconnected on that note. The global response to the 2020 invasion was divided and Asia itself was divided uh, while Japan put sanctions on Russia. Others like Singapore, Although against the act of aggression, uh, did criticize the Ukrainian approach to westernizing its policies. Uh, Russia shut off the Western financial system, yet Russian economy is still surviving. This is something that will shape the future of the conflict and how powerful the West is at containing the future conflicts through the economic sanctions. Uh, on that note, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Samir Puri for joining us today. And on behalf of CPPR and everyone present here, I would also like to thank Dr. Uday Balakrishnan, who has joined us online and who is one of the key organizers of this talk. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan is a former high-ranking officer with the government of India at various levels. After retirement, he is now associated with many universities and think tanks across India and around the world, including JNU New Delhi, 
Gateway House, Central European University, Budapest, uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, and Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Heartwell thanks to all the audience present here, both online and offline members, including our fellows who have joined us to the, in the office today. With this, we would like to conclude today's event and wish you all a good evening and thank you.